The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Our top stories this week: uh, an update on the science pundit <laughs> last week. Uh, uh, I got quoted in this, you know, the scientist thing about this work by Michael Levin and Josh Bongard and their students uh, that was, you know, marvelous proof of concept where they were using actual cells and putting them in configurations that have been developed by genetic algorithms for soft robots on a supercomputer. Uh, well, this is still blowing up bigger and bigger uh, uh, to the point where uh, this weekend. Josh Bongard was on CNN. Uh, scientists create first living self-healing robots. Uh, uh, there you have it. Uh, um, it really does make me think a little bit that, oh, well, also in combination with uh, Rod Brooks, uh, whom is probably known most for inventing the, the Roomba of uh, uh, robot vacuum cleaner, but did, you know, was an MIT uh, roboticist for decades and also an A Life and an uh, AI guy, and, and, and it's kind of a friend. Uh, well, we meet at conferences and so forth, uh, who recently, I guess December, uh, posted a tweet that got a, a fair bit of attention within Twitterverse. Uh, um, um, suggesting that the next revolution of artificial intelligence, AI, uh, may be artificial life. That that uh, the, if you follow what happened back in the 1980s, uh, most of the important things about modern deep learning AI, or at least the foundational things, were developed back then. You know, I was there. Uh, um, but the, we had the computers that we were, <laughs> were so slow, uh, uh, that, and there wasn't gi giant data sets. And, uh, and I've said this before, so Rodney's saying it as well. But now he's making the point that uh, you could get things happening using artificial life techniques, genetic algorithms. He's kind of muddling some things together that could be pulled apart. Um, that similarly, they were lacking, uh, you know, computational power, and that's coming on now, and so forth. So the next step is to take artificial life techniques, evolution, and so forth, and use them to uh, apply to AI kind of tasks. And you know, that may be kind of what's happening, uh, or what's starting to come down the pipe. So it may be a good time for the T2 Tile project with uh, explicitly using A life techniques for robust first. Uh, computing to be starting to come together. Well, we can hope. All right. Um, mostly what I want to talk to talk about today is uh, this uh, new uh, software design that I've worked on for the last couple of weeks for doing artificial chemistry, for doing chemical bonds uh, in uh, the T2 tile and the movable feast machine. Uh, this is going to become the uh, scientific submission to uh, the ALF 2020, so I need to, once again, put it behind the wall of science just like we did last year, uh, which I hate, because uh, <laughs> I want to be as open and transparent and as real-time as I possibly can, because, again, it helps me uh, to uh, uh, be presenting stuff uh, in a regular fashion, but, uh, um, you know, a Life 2020 submission deadlines. You know, when, when I was teaching, it's funny, I don't know if anybody really noticed because it really doesn't matter, but, you know, I, I always stayed away from the word submit and submission, you know, that, you know, because it seems so, you know, dominating, even though, you know, a teacher is kind of dominant. Uh, so I always use the phrase turn in, you know, the turn in script. I never said submit, but of course you had to turn it in. Uh, um, anyway, that's coming up March 1st. That's only five weeks away now, uh, and there's a lot of science that has to. To be done. So this is probably going to be about the last major event talking about the uh, stuff that's going into that. But what I want to talk about today is mostly about the software engineering of it because we've made some progress and it's also involved some changes to Ulam 5 which is still hanging around gaining striking new functionality when it was supposed to be in feature freeze for quite some time ago. Uh, uh, all right, so right, so here it is. Multiple inheritance plus class reflection gives us clean artificial chemistry. What the heck does that even mean? Now, in programming languages, uh, in object-oriented programming languages, this goes way back, and, you know, th there's all kinds of people who can fight back and forth about whether inheritance is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, uh, it's the idea that, you know, you can say, I'm describing all this behavior, but in addition, I want to take all of that behavior as well, and I am going to refine it. So whatever a, a 
mammal is is uh, you know I am a human so by default I do everything that a mammal does and I can add stuff and tweak stuff specific to humans mammal in turn inherits from animal it does everything that animal does and so forth that's inheritance and you know there's questions like I said about whether how good an, an idea it is but it also reflects the notion that you can be expressing your uh, abilities to other classes to other objects you say well I am a human then other classes can interact with the me object assuming that the uh, things that go with being human are something that I can respond to and to me, there seems to be a deep connection between that idea of a public base, a base class that says, you know, whatever it is, I can respond in this way, uh, um, and a chemical bond that in, in, in biology, you know, we have these incredibly complicated molecules that have these, you know, expose a bond over here and a bond over there, that, and this bond is a certain shape, so it does this, and this bond a certain shape does that, and so forth. Uh, but the idea is, is that anything that has the certain shape or the matching shape for that can interact with that molecule via that bond and, you know, do whatever it's going to do. And so, but it's critical that you be able to have multiple bonds. So in uh, languages like Java, you it are called single inheritance languages where you can only have one base class, one superclass. Now they've gradually made it more and more powerful so that you can do a lot of other stuff without it. Uh, uh, and we did the same path. Or Ulam up through Ulam 4 uh, uh, was a single inheritance language, or Ulam 3. Uh, um, but now in Ulam 5, we have multiple inheritance. So the idea would be to say, I inherit from, you know, next pointer bond. I inherit from previous pointer bond. And you can bond me together, my next with somebody else's previous, and we can make chains or trees or whatever by expressing bonds that we can do. So we need to have multiple inheritance in order to have multiple possible bonds. Uh, and that's where it was uh, a, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, uh, when I first started looking at this. Now, on the general topic of artificial chemistry, this, the idea of been focusing on bonds has been something that goes way back, and I wanted to just show a minute. This is 2011 and 90s, almost a decade old. Um, more stuff, trying to get big things to move in the movable feast. We've got these two meshes uh, that have a privileged end on the right and red that are uh, the red guys uh, specifically try to move to the right whenever they can. The light blue guys that are going nowhere just diffuse. And these dark blue guys that are trucking pretty good here. So what I wanted to point out here is that it's not just a collection of colored circles like we see in the movable feast machine all the time. It's got these lines in between them and the lines that represent chemical bonds. And some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. Each of these has a potential for four bonds so that it makes kind of a mesh. And, you know, this was this was coded, oh man, I don't even know. It was probably in, in C++, it was probably before the Java code, and all of this stuff was custom done. And in the first version of the, so we're currently on what's called the P3 Atom, uh, using the movable feast. It's 96 bits, and it has all these various properties. And the P1 Atom, which I don't even think this was it. This was before the P1 Atom was formalized. But one of the major papers about the stuff that we've done was all about the P1 Atom, it explicitly had room for these bits represent these kind of bonds and those bits represent those kind of bonds and, and there's a little count of how many bonds there are supposed to be and it allowed you to write things that had these kind of you know connections between them that would stretch and shrink but try to stay attached um, fairly easily but it also it took up a tremendous amount of the atom as being hard coded with this one particular style for atoms I'm sorry for bonds and there was really no place else to go with it so we went to the p3 atom we threw away the bonds entirely now you just have this raw empty apartment of you know 71 bits uh, uh, that you can do whatever you want with and, and you can implement you know sort of bond like structures by saying you know this this group of bits indicates the site where the opposite guy is and the opposite guy has a group of bits points back at me and so forth and we've done that several times but what we're doing now is saying 
can we build up some slightly more, uh, you know, formal structures, more uh, software library stuff that will allow us to get some of the flavor of this uh, without having it fundamentally burned into the movable feast machine and therefore unchangeable and everybody stuck with it. And that's what we have now. So, okay. Uh, um, the without going through the details of it because i'm eating up way too much time and i want to do a demo uh, uh the idea is we have a base class called q bond that describes what bonds are supposed to be able to do they're supposed to check their consistency they're supposed to be able to say could you move here uh, and here's how we're going to do it please update and can i bond with you please make a bond and so forth the problem with all this is you see these all 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 is that we need to be able to not have just one bond because we're going to use multiple inheritance and have a pre bond and a next bond a head bond a tail bond whatever it may be uh, um, and that means we can't decide can we move to a given place by just asking one bond we have to ask all of the bonds so where we were last October when I was first trying to lay out this structure is the um, we had these base classes, but uh, um, in order to use them, as you got more and more complicated structures, you had to write more and more. Let's see, Bondo? Yeah. Uh, um, so, head Bondo. All right. Uh, um, so, here it is. Check consistency, could move to all the things that you have to do for that, and so forth. Now, the, the head guy just has one bond going backwards. The mid guy, where's the mid, mid guy? This is the mid guy. So when he checks consistency, he has to in turn call, call these to from and to, from and to, and so forth. And it even went to, I went to a thing that had four bonds. And now, so now that the, the amount of sort of overhead code that you had to write, so to be a monomer, uh, you know, Q monomer with two bonds and so forth, uh, uh, here's your rationalize, your move, your swap, your bond with, and then here's the other one. And, and the classes were just getting completely filled up with this boilerplate to dish out to the bonds and the bonds that we had. <sighs> I didn't like that. It, it really meant the code was not pretty and not pretty code matters because this is what forms our mental models as programmers. And if we're just completely in the swamp of taking care of this low level uh, sort of, you know, maintenance of, of bonds over and over and over again, it's going to be terrible. And that's where it was. But Instead, what has happened now uh, is we have invented, invented, we have implemented class reflection, a simple form of class reflection in Ulam for Ulam 5. Now, what that means is, is normally in an object-oriented language, you declare things like class square, class triangle, class circle, class shape, whatever it is, and you make relationships among them. And, that, and those define types, which are fairly rigid, and the compiler for the language understands them and can do things with them. And it makes as many decisions about what it can do at compile time when you're turning the code into something runnable, not when the code is actually running. A class reflection system allows at runtime one class to ask another object, like, what class are you? What are your base classes? What do you inherit from? And deal with that not by pre-compiled saying, oh, you are a Cubon, but having some other way of doing it. So now we have a class utils that's appearing in standard lib, and we have the idea of a class ID. And you can get, take a reference to anything you can take an atom and say what is the class id that is currently in here and you can do different stuff based on it and so we're using that in the cubond uh, uh, class now so that and, and now we have iterators you can say please go through this loop at runtime showing each base class of a given object and we can make decisions about what to do that and what that has allowed us to do is uh, take all of that consistency checking uh, the consistency checking, the can we swap, can we move, can we make a bond, and so forth. And instead of having to rewrite that over and over and over again, uh, we can do it using reflection. So we're saying, okay, how do we update for a swap for something that's some kind of Q-bond? It may have multiple bonds, multiple bonds, we don't know, but we know it inherits from Q-bond, so it has at least one bond. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through all of the base classes it's got with the class base iterator that we just got and take all of the, the base classes that are a subclass of Cubond and we'll ask them one by one and there's a new structure 
so Q, QB, Q bond, square brackets, CI, that where the square brackets, CI allows you to say, here's a class index saying, I want to call a specific base class method uh, that is associated with this class ID. So we can go through it using this new syntax and saying, check this base, check this base, check this base. And it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when we saw before that uh, the polymer classes say uh, um, we're all f full of, and, and now this is it. This is yeah, this is it. Uh, um, so polymer takes the, the the base class, which tells us how to do an event for these particular polymers. Uh, uh, but now there's very very little code in it. There's how to make a, choose to hook up if you can between your monitor and uh, set colors, and that's it. That's the whole code. All of the check consistency, can I swap? Do the swap has all been lifted out by using class reflection. So let's you know, oh geez, we're already out of time, but let's try this real quick. Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, and now we're compiling, so it's going to take forever. Ah, well, this one's going to run a little long. It's also going to be late because <laughs> I was working all last night, Monday night into Tuesday morning, getting this stuff working because there's another cool thing in it that we'll see in just a second. Uh, so this we may be going 20 minutes today. I'm sorry, uh, uh, especially because compilation takes so much longer when we're all <laughs> recording, uh, uh, screen grabbing, and so forth. Uh, um, Jesus, take forever. Oh, well, we're also optimizing. <sighs> uh, uh, there we go. All right. Uh, so let's get rid of this. Uh, all right, so we'll put down a seed. We give it a seed, we give the seed an event, it springs out into a head, tail, check it out. The bonds are getting drawn. <laughs> How could that be? Uh, uh, the, the code to write through this graphics is all very specific to MFMS, the simulator. I mean, it's going to be on the tiles as well, but it's not something that Ulam previously had any way of doing. So does that mean that we have now, uh, you know, gone back to hard coding bonds in the underlying engine? No. In addition to doing this class reflection system and supporting multiple inheritance, now in Ulam 5, we're exposing a graphics interface that allows atoms to draw stuff. Well, at the moment, all they can draw is lines, but it's easy to extend it to be able to do rectangles and circles and what's not and so forth. Uh, uh, so in fact, where, oops, uh, uh, there it is. Uh, uh, we have a bond renderer and... And it works great. And it's already the case. Uh, uh, oh, well, uh, let's um, get our polymers as well. M2, M4. Uh, uh. So the, the green guys and the blue guys can interface with each other and so on. Uh, um, and at the moment, see, unlike the head and tail bondo, which you have a seed that springs out fully bonded, these guys polymerize. They just look around themselves and they find stuff that are they are suitable with by matching bond same tag opposite ends. You know, one one true, one false. They match up, and it oh, go, oh yeah. And this is going really slowly. Why is this going really slowly? Because right, because we're defaulting to enabling logging. There we go. Um, uh, uh. So, in fact, the very uh, first time I started playing with this, well, so you get the idea. I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, I'm going to be using this to try to do artificial chemistry to get some basic mappings between the chemistry and the software engineering to try to get, you know, to head in the direction of getting useful stuff done. Systems engineering in uh, the movable feast machine in the T2 tiles using bonds, which has been easily a decade uh, uh, journey away and then finally back again. So that's where we are this week. It's pretty cool. Um, now, you know, in this case, we can also 
you know, if we come in right now and, you know, erase some of these guys, like, you know, the, whole, the rest of itself all cleans up. We, we, we cause inconsistencies. At the moment, the default behavior, if an inconsistency is found, uh, the guy just er erases himself, and that causes anything he's connected to to be inconsistent and so forth. So as a result, the thing all cleans itself up. It doesn't have to be that way, and that's the kind of part of the behavior that we want to be writing. All right, I got to stop. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and, and so I was going to say, but we've already kind of talked about it, that as soon as I got it implemented, I started seeing stuff like this. Uh, this M2 guy thought he was connected to this M4, but the M4 didn't think he was connected back because, in fact, the rendering system for bonds actually only renders, for, from each side, it renders half the bond, and then the other one renders the other half. So inconsistencies turned out to be really easy to see. So I started playing around with this, and, and I you know delivered an event to this guy deliberately, and he moved down here and stole the event back and now this guy looked like he was inconsistent and it's like you know what was that you know so it was some kind of bug it was clearly some kind of bug and i played around with it some more and it was so totally obvious rendering the bonds visually made it so obvious i'd been looking at these numbers you know bond site this bond site that never seen this problem before and this went all the way back to the stuff from october uh it became completely obvious it was also completely obvious that it would the the M2 guy, when he was stealing the thing back, it wasn't like he was just randomly grabbing a guy. It was like he still thought he was connected to him, which makes sense because he had his half a bond. Uh, uh, and the thing that should have caused this guy to blow up because he was inconsistent wasn't causing him to blow up. A and that pretty quickly led me to the check consistency all rule, and, and it was wrong. And this is now the fixed one, and, and with it fixed, everything is good. All right, uh, uh, so artificial chemistry is what it's about. We're going behind the wall of science, so I'm going to start talking instead uh, about uh, the sequencing intertile events. So I'm going to be splitting my time between getting the intertile events going because we really need that and working on the artificial chemistry. I'm sorry this went so long. The next update will be out in a week. Uh, thanks for being here. You know, I, I always say thanks for being here. And, you know, for the folks who, who do check them out week by week, thank you really very much. But, you know, if you're here from the future, <laughs> you know, whether it's an, uh, a week later, a month later, or who knows, 10 years later, you know, thanks for taking a look. And how did we do? How did 2020 come out for A Life and the Movable Feast and the T2 Tile Project? I'm really curious to know. We'll see you next week.